Today, I will focus on Southern California during the Civil War, which was described, as the title says, as a hotbed of disloyalty. We'll discuss the political and social situations in the state and the decade leading to the war, and the figures that played a role during the war, as well as what the circumstances were that led to a high percentage of Confederate sympathizers congregating in Southern California specifically. California was the newest addition to the United States for much of the decade leading to the Civil War. Having been forcibly ceded by Mexico in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, California was briefly an American territory before becoming a state in 1850, following the start of the gold rush. Before, during, and after the discussions to admit California as a state, there were calls to divide it into two or even three parts. Although the state remained whole, a deep division did in fact exist. Northern California had a large growing population with people from around the globe coming to the gold fields to seek a fortune. At the same time, Southern California remained sparsely populated. The northern part of the state benefited financially from the wealth of mining operations, while the southern part remained agrarian, with the focus mainly on cattle ranching. During this antebellum period, Southern California residents were land rich and cash poor. The region had been divided into massive ranchos during the Spanish and Mexican periods, which resulted in much of the land being owned by a few California families. Californians of Spanish and Mexican descent referred to themselves as Californios. Although these residents of California became American citizens when the region was ceded to the United States, Many did not feel loyalty to their new nation and still tied their identity to the California culture that dominated in the Mexican period. While there were prominent Californios, names that you might recognize like Juan Bandini or Mar Mariano Vallejo, who voiced admiration for the American government, there were also many who felt resentment towards Anglo-Americans and the American system of governments. The most significant complaints from these people were issues of taxation and representation stemming from the adoption of the California Constitution of 1849. So the Constitution stated in part that taxation shall be equal and uniform throughout the state and that all property in this state shall be taxed in proportion to its value to be ascertained as directed by law. So for Southern California landowners who owned vast properties, this was a particularly difficult statute to accept. Many argued that being expected to pay the same amount in taxes as the richer Northern counties was unfair and was draining them of their resources. In addition to taxation, the other significant issue was that Southerners felt they were underrepresented in the state legislature. The constitution stated that, quote, representations shall be apportioned according to the population. Now, for the thinly populated southern counties, this meant fewer representatives. And even though the Constitution called for a census in 1852 and then another one in 1855, and then a count every 10 years after that, since the majority of new immigrants were arriving in the northern part of the state, this would continue to imbalance representation for the South in the legislature. An additional issue that was cited by Southerners was the vastness of the state as a whole, which made it difficult and costly for Southern representatives to travel to and from the state seat in Vallejo, which was on the eastern coast of San Pablo Bay, north of San Francisco. You can see it circled here uh, in the map. Sacramento became the capital in 1852, but this did not improve the problem. In 1850, landowners and political figures in the Southern counties cited each of these issues in their call for dividing the state and creating a separate territory of Southern California from San Luis Obispo through San Diego. It was argued that free from burdensome taxation, the territory could form a system of governance that was better suited to an agrarian society. In order to accomplish this, lawmakers decided that a new state constitution was necessary. The proposal to call a constitutional convention was introduced as early as 1851. Uh, legislatures disagreed with the need for a convention and they didn't really entertain the idea of splitting the state. But this was just the first of several calls to divide California throughout the 1850s. 
The last significant effort came before the war in February of 1859, when Los Angeles County Assembly person Andres Pico, who was the brother of the last Mexican governor of California, Pio Pico, Andres introduced a resolution to create the territory of Colorado out of those Southern counties from San Luis Obispo to San, uh, San Diego. The bill, which came to be known as the PICO Act, was approved by the state legislature in April and passed overwhelmingly in the September general election, particularly in Los Angeles, where it won 1,467 for to 441 against. The governor at the time was a Democrat named John Weller, and he signed the bill, but it was eventually killed in Congress in 1860 because of the looming civil war. Now the disunion sentiment did not disappear once the war began. It actually rose to the surface again and became quite strengthened during the war. The contrast between the regions was most apparent in the polit political affiliations in 1850s California. At first there was the Whig party which made way for the Republican Party in the second half of the decade. Nationally, the Republican Party was formed by anti-slavery Democrats and Whigs. The party opposed slavery and worked to prevent it in the Western territories. There was also the Democratic Party, which included the chivalry. The chivalry, or the shivs, were the pro-slavery faction of the Democratic Party in California. The Democratic Party, favored national economic development, they supported slavery, and favored its expansion throughout the country. And the party was split between the Northern and Southern Democrats in the decade before the Civil War. In Southern California, the Democratic Party ascended in the 1850s. Many of the region's prominent Democratic figures hailed from slaveholding Southern states, which created a tense atmosphere in the lead up to the war. Understanding the importance of the California vote, or what was termed wooing the Mexican vote, led many Democrats to build friendships with California landowners and establish a political following, which was based on kind of casual friendship. This was particularly true in Los Angeles. In the 1850s, Los Angeles was a small pueblo, had about 1,100 people, and it was growing with many new Anglo-American entrepreneurs moving there and starting businesses. But the city was also rife with vigilantism and was rampant with violence and general lawlessness in that decade. Following the height of the gold rush, many failed miners, gamblers, and criminals moved south. By the middle part of the decade, the city had over 400 gambling halls and reported an average of one murder per day. There were also tensions between residents of California ancestry and the newly arrived Anglos. Tensions that were worsened by the Anti-Vagrancy Act, which was known as the Greaser Act of 1855, which was presented as a means of deterring crime, but was actually a way to legalize discriminatory actions by Anglo-Americans against people of color, particularly people of Mexican descent and Native Americans. This was just one of several laws that directly targeted non-Anglo people in the state and added to the tensions that were already present in the lead up to the Civil War. By 1860, California had nearly 380,000 inhabitants, which was an increase of 410% from just a decade earlier. Of those 380,000 residents in the state, less than 10,000 lived in Los Angeles County, and only about 4,300 lived in the city of Los Angeles. Interestingly, 40% of Los Angeles County residents were California born at the time, and only 29% were born outside of the United States. By contrast, San Francisco was the state's most populous city with about 52,800 residents, and it was the 15th largest city in the United States at the time. Today, San Francisco is the 16th largest city in the US, and Los Angeles is the second largest. As I've mentioned, the most populous counties in the states were all in Northern California at this period. Politically, the state was led by Democrats in 1860. Democrat John Downey, for which the city of Downey is named, became governor in January of 1860, and the two senators, Henry Hahn and Milton Latham, were also both Democrats. Southern California in particular was majority Democrat. The region had a large number of residents from Southern states, as well as many Northern Democrats 
and immigrants who came to sympathize with the Confederacy when the war began. The lead up to the 1860 election really inflamed political differences. And there were many, particularly in Southern California, who were prepared to support secession if it came to that. As you know, the presidential election took place in November of 1860. And as you can see in this chart, Abraham Lincoln won the state's four electoral votes. Southern California overwhelmingly voted for John Breckinridge, except for San Bernardino County, which supported Lincoln. This is actually an interesting fact given some of the issues that I'll discuss later. And as you can see here, the Southern states voted mostly for Southern Democrat John C. Breckinridge and John Bell of the Constitutional Union Party. So this sharp divide between the two sections of the country is what eventually led to the Civil War. When the war began, many men from California joined the military on both sides. While there were no battles in California, the war was fought here in different ways. It was fought in newspapers and clubhouses and saloons. And disunion was a hot topic in the state, particularly in the early years of the war. In January of 1860, outgoing California governor John B. Weller used his last message to the state legislature to say, quote, if the wild spirit of fanaticism which now pervades in the land should destroy our magnificent confederacy, which God forbid, California will not go with the south or north, but here upon the shores of the Pacific found a mighty republic, which may in the end prove the greatest of all. Willer said this in January of 1860, which was nearly 10 months before Lincoln's election and more than a year prior to the start of the Civil War. And this idea of a Pacific Republic that he referenced began to pick up steam at this point, with secessionist sentiments became strongest. Some pro-secessionists in California took up the bear flag used in the Bear Flag Revolt of 1846 as a symbol of this new rebellion being plotted within the state and attempted to use the flag to rally supporters. On January 18th of 1861, the Stockton Argus newspaper reported, quote, we are informed that a flag will be raised in the city today and a salute fired upon the occasion. At the first step in the organization of a Pacific Republic, the flag is of silk and of medium size of the national ensign. And with the exception of the union, evidently a misnomer in this case, which contains a lone star upon a blue background, is covered by a painting represented a wild mountain scene, a huge grizzly bear standing in the foreground and the words Pacific Republic near the upper border. What the program or who the actors in this new Republic movement have not yet transpired. A few dozen men, all of them repudiated as leaders by the public opinion of the state, and most of them known and without influence will hardly succeed in establishing a quote, Pacific Republic. Any fool can buy a flag and burn powder, but it will require many to cut off the bonds that unite us to the Eastern states. Now this was in January of 1861, just before the war began. The disunion sentiment strengthened in the state once the war was underway. And in June, the Daily National Democrat of Marysville, California reported the following quote, Fellow citizens, a secret organization we learn exists in Southern California whose object is to raise the secession flag among us and then in the neighboring counties. The native population have been tampered with, their prejudices and passions appealed to, and they have been promised a return of the ancient regime if they will only join these traitors and their nefarious designs. Now the native population that the article refers to is the Californios uh, and people of Mexican ancestry who lived in the state. And that quote, ancient regime is likely a California run government. Now the article continued, quote, a volcano is immediately under our feet, which may break out into a fearful eruption ere we have time to prepare for it. We are not alarmists, but we are informed by reliable persons who know that such an organization exists. Mexicans are holding secret meetings at every hamlet and rancho where the conspirators can gather. Near Los Angeles is where the chiefs rendezvous and hold their headquarters. And so soon as the news of an anticipated victory by the forces of the secessionists over the government troops is received, then is the time for them to strike." Close quote. 
So the supposed plan, as the paper reported, was to use the bear flag to rally supporters throughout the region. And the supporters would join a large army of reinforcements from Northern California, and together they would, quote, rob, murder, burn, and destroy, and then fly with their booty across the line uh, if they were caught or if they were in danger of being caught. Finally, the cir if circumstances allowed, the plan was for the group to seize San Diego as a port of entry on the Pacific coast for the Southern Confederacy. Now, news of the plot was regularly mentioned in newspapers across the state, causing concern for some residents and not so much for others. In this letter from the Shrine's collections, civilian Thomas Hamley writes from San Francisco about the state secessionists and the Pacific Republic scheme. He wrote, quote, your political troubles seem to have no end, while we out here are as calm as a summer, summer morning. The secessionists here are very weak indeed, although we have such apathy in our legislature. In regard to the state, there is not the slightest ground for the stories circulated by the paper of an intention to organize a Pacific Union. No such intention except in the mind of any body of men of number of force sufficient to begin such an affair. The state is, in my judgment, as sound as Delaware or Pennsylvania upon the Union question. Now, Hampley's estimation of the weakness of secessionists in California was not necessarily wrong, but was colored by the fact that he was in San Francisco because Northern California had less vocal dissenters than there were in Southern California. Despite Hamley's assurances, the secessionists sentiment would be beaten within the state. It was you know, a valid concern. So as you can see in this letter, which was written from Sierra Valley, California by Ali Chapman. She wrote about a man who she referred to as Reverend Armstrong, who was a Southern Methodist preacher who was known to sympathize with the rebellion and who believed, as you can read in the quote on the screen, that quote, slavery was a divine institution. Ali continued her letter by describing what happened once Reverend Armstrong's sermon was over. Quote, after services, he told them who he was and what he was, that he was sent by the M.E. Church South, etc., and requesting all who were in favor of his coming regular by to preach to them to rise. Not a person moved. After waiting for a few moments, he remarked that he supposed it was of no use to make call for the opposite side or make any further appointments and taking his hat left. And that was the last we heard of the Reverend Southerner, but the last of the joke. While the people of Sierra Valley were not receptive to Reverend Armstrong's advocacy for the Southern cause, this wasn't true everywhere. In Southern California in particular, there were many communities with groups who were openly pro-Confederacy. One of Los Angeles's most vocal secessionists was Sheriff Tomas Sanchez. Sheriff Sanchez was an interesting character who was representative of many Californios. He owned Rancho La Cienega o Paseo de la Tijera, which he inherited from his grandfather in 1846 when he was just 24 years old. The property came to the family as a Mexican land grant given by Governor Manuel Michel Torena to Tomas's grandfather, who was a former mayor of Los Angeles. The Sanchez's were one of the city's original 12 families. Tomas served in a special cavalry unit, the Lanceros, during the Mexican-American War and fought in the Battle of San Pascual, which was one of the few examples of Mexican forces defeating the American military. Having occupied a variety of public offices in Los Angeles, Tomas was a well-liked, recognizable figure. In the years leading up to that, he participated in vigilante actions, searching for criminals, and he eventually helped form the City Guards, which was Los Angeles's first police force. In 1860, Tomas became the first American of Spanish ancestry to become sheriff of Los Angeles a position he was re-elected to seven consecutive years. While Tomas was a devoted Angelino, he, like many Californios, did not feel the same devotion to the American government. He fought against the American military during the Mexican-American War, and much of that resentment was still present for people during the American period, particularly the period right before the war began. It was for this reason that Tomas supported the PICO Act, which sought to divide California and form an independent state from the mostly 
California Southern counties. When the Civil War began, Sheriff Sanchez's support of the possibility of California seceding was well known. So it was not a surprise that he financed the Los Angeles Mounted Rifles. The Los Angeles Mounted Rifles was a secessionist militia group formed in March of 1861 that was led by Under Sheriff Alonzo Ridley and financed and armed by Sheriff Sanchez. Here you can see a muster roll which states that 80 men joined the group when it was formed. Most men were in their 20s and 30s and few had military experience. A majority were from Los Angeles and about 10% had Spanish surnames. The Los Angeles Mounted Rifles was openly pro-secession and its leader later confirmed that the group was organized specifically to benefit the Confederate cause. The rifles intended to arm themselves and represent the Confederacy in California, but they later decided to go east to join the Confederate military. Now they had, they had to find a way to do that and we will talk about that later. Alonzo Ridley, the group's leader, made arrangements for the Mounted Rifles to join the rebellion in Texas and the group left in June of 1861 along with other former military figures who resigned their po posts to join the Confederacy. The Bella Union Hotel on Main Street in Los Angeles was a gathering place for ex-Southerners and pro-secessionists who openly supported the Confederate cause. Confederate sympathizers even reportedly hung a giant portrait of Confederate General P.G.T. Beauregard in the hotel saloon and could be heard singing the songs, Hurrah for Jeff Davis and We'll Drive the Bloody Tyrant Lincoln from Our Dear Native Soil. The city's most ardent anti-Union, anti-Lincoln mouthpiece was the Los Angeles Star newspaper, which was edited by Henry Hamilton, who was a rabid pro-slavery Democrat and racist. Hamilton was a strong advocate for slavery, despite never having visited the South or even seeing slavery firsthand. Hamilton's pronounced Southern sympathies are particularly interesting when you consider that he was born in Derry, Northern Ireland, and migrated to the United States in 1848 as a result of the Irish potato famine. He arrived in California two years later during the gold rush and spent some time as a miner and then a newspaper editor in Northern California. So slavery was really in no way a part of his past life. He began publishing the Star newspaper in 1856 and quickly established it in favor of politicians and political views espoused by the Democratic Party at the time, which was key to the paper's success, given that Democrats ruled in Southern California. Throughout the war, Hamilton railed against Lincoln and in support of the Confederate cause, spouting his racist views in his constant editorials. As a result of his obvious support for the rebellion, Hamilton was arrested during the war. He was jailed for 10 days and expected to be incarcerated at Fort Alcatraz. Hamilton never reached Alcatraz and was sent back to Southern California. And in celebration of his release, Secessionists in the town of El Monte held an event in his honor. The celebration in honor of Hamilton in El Monte is not surprising at all. El Monte was a community that was known for her extremists and vigilante action. A majority of the residents of El Monte were from Southern states, including many who came from Texas. El Monte residents were openly pro-slavery, anti-Republican Democrats. So it made sense that a new militia group formed there. The Monte Mounted Rifles came together on May 7, 1861. While there had been militia groups in El Monte prior to the war, the Monte Mounted Rifles came together less than a month after the war began. The group included 70 men who were described as vigilante prone, and the Monte Mounted Rifles would appear in the plaza in Los Angeles to intimidate Union men before riding off. They'd also spend time in Bell Union Hotel making threats against Unionists and probably singing some of those songs that I mentioned. The group's behavior was particularly troubling to military officials in Los Angeles, who reported that the bear flag had been paraded down the streets in El Monte in support of the Confederacy shortly after the war began. As a vocal as Confederate sympathizers in Los Angeles and El Monte were, the center of secessionist activity in Southern California was in San Bernardino's Holcomb Valley. A former Mormon settlement, San Bernardino was a prosperous and fast-growing area at the start of the war. In the summer of 1861, the San Bernardino Patriot 
a Republican newspaper reported that there were, quote, many secessionists in Southern counties of California. It says that secessionists are recruiting all through these counties. Mexicans are being enlisted and everyone who can raise a horse is busy in drumming up recruits. A company of about 200 men have left within the past few days. In the Holcomb Valley, in the San Bernardino Mountains, the gold mining boomtown of Bellevue was a particular concern. Bellevue was established following a gold discovery in 1860 and grew quickly in population, soon becoming the largest town in the region. When the war began, it was a center of secessionist sympathizers who military officials were concerned could be mobilizing to lead secessionists in California to join the state to the Confederacy. The Daily Alta California newspaper published a letter from Holcomb Valley in September of 1861, which stated, quote, this place is getting hot. The secessionists are holding secret meetings two or three times a week. There is a rendezvous on the Colorado and runners are continually passing back and forth. Some of the leading men of Los Angeles and San Bernardino are encouraging them. The union men hold meetings here every Saturday night and we are well armed. And we think that if they make a break, we can clean them so quickly that it will make their heads swim. They are very saucy and some of the union men expect, expect lively times before long. It has been rumored that Major Van Dorn is coming across to revolutionize Southern California and that these chaps are preparing to assist him. They have been providing themselves well with all sorts of dangerous specimens of sticking and shooting irons and every fellow has a respectable little arsenal. A reference to Confederate Major Earl Van Dorn refers to reports about a group of nearly 400 men that was believed to be forming throughout the Southwest. The group claimed to have taken over a military arsenal in Texas and were supposed to be acting as an advance guard for Major Van Dorn. The Holcomb Valley secessionists were expected to move east to join them on their way to northern Mexico, where they planned to establish a foothold. Well, it was reported at the time, this plot was later confirmed in a letter written by Judge Lansford W. Hastings, who it turns out was the architect of the plot. These Holcomb Valley men may have belonged to a shadowy group called the Knights of the Golden Circle, which were known to be training recruits to join the Confederate military in San Bernardino and the Holcomb Valley. The Knights of the Golden Circle were a secret organization founded in 1854 with their aims set on colonizing parts of Mexico and the Caribbean. During the war, members worked surreptitiously to benefit the Confederacy and found most support amongst copperheads in the North and Southwest. The paramilitary group held drilling demonstrations in San Bernardino and commandeered a schooner in San Francisco Bay to raid commerce on the Pacific coast. The Knights of the Golden Circle joined other Copperheads to become part of the Order of the Sons of Liberty in 1864. And I've mentioned several paramilitary groups now, the Los Angeles Mounted Rifles, the Monte Mounted Rifles, Knights of the Golden Circle. But what I haven't done is discuss how military authorities in California and Los Angeles in particular dealt with their activities. California was part of the Department of the Pacific, whose commander in 1860 was Brigadier General Albert Sidney Johnston. Originally from Kentucky, Johnston moved to Texas in 1860 and served during the Texas War of Independence, eventually becoming a Brigadier General. In 1838, Johnston was appointed Secretary of War of the newly created Republic of Texas. Johnston soon returned to Kentucky and served in the United States military during the Mexican-American War and worked his way up in the ranks of the military in the decade that followed, mostly serving in the West. He was appointed commander of the Department of the Pacific in late 1860 and arrived in San Francisco to take over the post in December of that year. Although he was opposed to secession, he resigned from the United States military after the start of the rebellion out of loyalty to his Southern roots. Johnson waited for his replacement, General Edmund Sumner, to arrive before leaving San Francisco. He traveled to Los Angeles, where he and his wife stayed with her brother, John Griffin, who was a respected surgeon and a former member of the Los Angeles City Council. 
Johnson's presence in Los Angeles and the rumors of his allegiance to the Confederacy posed a problem to the military commanders in the city. His replacement as commander of the Department of the Pacific was General Edwin Sumner, who was a longtime military veteran. Sumner entered the Army in 1819 and went on to serve in the Black Hawk and Mexican-American Wars. Following Lincoln's election in 1860, Sumner advised Lincoln to carry a weapon for protection and was assigned as his senior military officer who accompanied Lincoln from Springfield to Washington, D.C. for his inauguration. When he took over for Albert Sidney Johnson in California in 1861, Sumner assessed the situation and noted the influence of secessionists in Southern California and the plan to align the state with the Confederacy. About this, Sumner wrote, in April 1861, quote, I have found it necessary to withdraw the troops from Fort Mojave and place them at Los Angeles. There is more danger of disaffection at this place than any other in the state. There are a number of influential men who are decided secessionists, and if we have difficulty, it will commence there. In response, he sent Company K, First Dragoons, from Fort Tejon to Los Angeles, and then created a new military district in Southern California in late September, placing Colonel George Wright, who was a veteran of 39 years in the military, in charge. Sumner's decision with regards to Los Angeles came from reports from Captain Winfield Scott Hancock. Winfield Scott Hancock was quartermaster in the Army's Southern District of the Department of the Pacific, and was the only regular army officer in Los Angeles in 1861. You may be familiar with Hancock from his service in the East later in the war, but when the war began, he was in California, having been stationed here since 1859. Although he was a Democrat, Hancock faced the political and social unrest of 1860 that was especially rampant in Los Angeles and he was vigilant of a vocal contingent of pro-secession Democrats in Shivs, including the region's Californios, whose loyalty Hancock questioned. He defended the city's munitions to keep them from falling in the hands of the militia groups that formed in and around the city. And it's in anticipation of rebellion in the region, Hancock asked General Sumner for reinforcements, which resulted in Sumner sending the company from Fort Tejon in April. The arrival of federal troops meant that pro-secessionists were outnumbered in Los Angeles. Another concern for Hancock was the presence of former military figures who were in the city. He was aware that Albert Sidney Johnston and other former colleagues who were sympathetic to the South who were living in Los Angeles. In mid-June 1861, the group resolved to leave Los Angeles and make their way east to join the Confederate military. The evening before the group left the city, they were invited to dine at Hancock's home. These men were all friends, and they were colleagues who had served together in the military. And the way they were divided by the war is representative of the war overall in a lot of ways. Hancock described the dinner in his memoirs, writing, quote, All were endeavored to conceal under smiling exteriors hearts that were filled with sadness over the sundering of lifelong ties. The four men surreptitiously left the city with the Los Angeles Mounted Rifles and traveled across southwestern United States. This was in mid-June, and they didn't arrive in New Mexico until the end of July. So you can imagine what their experience was like as they rode east to join the rebellion. Albert Sidney Johnston received a hero's welcome in Texas and eventually made his way to Richmond, where he went on to become the highest ranking military officer in the Confederate Army. He was killed at the Battle of Shiloh less than a year later. As evidenced in the example of Henry Hamilton, the editor of the Los Angeles Star newspaper, Fort Alcatraz in San Francisco Bay was used as a military prison during the war. Having been completed in 1859, the military installation was new at the time and was originally, originally used to muster and train new recruits when the Civil War began. It was used to house soldiers who were accused of crimes, as well as civilians who were accused of treason. About seven years ago, researchers from Texas A&M University used radar scanning to discover a series of tunnels and buildings dating back to this period under the current structures on the island. 
The Shrine's collections include several letters written from California during the war, including one by Charles Way from San Francisco that references the military prison at Alcatraz. Way, Way wrote, quote, whenever a copperhead lets himself out a little too heavy, we lock him up. General McDowell is here now. Last week, he sent two Democrats to Fort Alcatraz. Copperheads are very unpopular here. As seen in this September 1864 letter written from Sonoma, California by S.H. Mont, many of the state's Confederate sympathizers chose to leave rather than risk draft. Mott wrote, there is but little said about drafting here at present. About a year ago, there was not a little excitement among some of the secesh, so much so that it caused a number to leave the state for Nevada. But they find they can't do just as they have a mind to do there, but they will endure almost anything rather than face the draft. While pro-secessionists were numerous and vocal, in Southern California. There's also a large group of influential people who oppose secession. A group called the Native Cavalry formed in 1863 and was led by prominent Californios Andres Pico, Mariano Vallejo, and Antonio de la Guerra. Members were recruited from throughout the state in spite of opposition from some Californio families and Confederate sympathizers. The group came to have 483 enlisted men, eight captains, and 16 lieutenants. All 16 lieutenants were Anglos allied with Californios. They were all aged 18 to 34, with the oldest person being only 43 years old. A muster roll shows most, quote, natives were people born in Mexican California or Mexico. The occupations of these men varied. There were ranchers, farmers, carpenters, laborers, shoemakers, cooks, teamsters, sailors. Captain Jose Antonio Pico, who was the older brother of Andres Pico, commanded the group for a brief period. Jose was a prominent figure in his own right, and he made a speech, as you can see here, in a recruitment rally for the Native Cavalry in San Jose. Harkening back to the call made to Californios during the Mexican-American War, he said, quote, Sons of California, our country calls and we must obey. This rebellion of the southern states must be crushed. They must come back into the Union and pay obedience to the stars and stripes. United, we will become the freest and mightiest republic on earth. Crowned monarchs must be driven away from the sacred continent of free America. Strike for your altars and your fires. Strike for the green graves of your sires. Strike for our union's emblem grand, star-spangled banner, God, and your native land. The fact that a Californio would come out so strongly in support of the union cause was incredibly significant for the longtime residents of California, whose loyalty may have been wavering. Tasked with heading off a supposed French Confederate link, the 1st Battalion of Native Cavalry went on a patrol in the Colorado River region to the Mexican border as far as Texas. They guarded telegraph lines, isolated settlements, and road travelers. While they did fight with Apache warriors, they never encountered Confederates or French. Another well-known, reputable California who supported the Union cause was Mariano Vallejo. Vallejo was a wealthy landowner who held a lot of clout within the state. He was commandant of the 4th Military District and Director of Colonization of the Northern Frontier, which was the highest military position in Northern California. He worked to block colonization attempts by Americans in the period leading up to the Mexican-American War and was taken prisoner during the Bear Flag Revolt. His prominent position in the state meant that he was acquainted with many military figures who had served in California in the period leading to the Mexican-American War, including General William Tecumseh Sherman, Henry Halleck, Joseph Hooker, Phil Sheridan, and Ulysses S. Grant. Unlike many of his counterparts, Vallejo had a respect for Americans, reportedly saying, quote, the Yankees are wonderful people. Wherever they go, they make improvements. He had expressed similar sentiments long before California was part of the United States because he believed the region could progress under American rule in a way that was impossible under the Mexican government. He was instrumental in convincing Californios to accept the American government during the transition. His influence was such that he was even granted an audience with Abraham Lincoln to discuss issues related to land grants in California. 
He served as an important figurehead for the effort of pro-Union Californios, and his son Platon served as a surgeon in the Union Army in Washington, D.C. during the war. Thanks to the work of loyalists and military officials in California, the state underwent a huge political shift in the first couple of years of the war. Industrialist Leland Stanford's election as governor of the state in late 1861 cemented Republican control over California politics. He was actually the first Republican governor uh, in California. The rupture of the Democratic Party over issues of slavery and secession made it impossible for the party to keep control. Stanford took over for John Downey, who was a loyal Union Democrat and had to contend with pro-secessionists in the state throughout his two-year term. Downey lost much of his support in late 1861 when the question of whether to support the rebels or the Union split California's Democratic Party, as it did nationally. As I have mentioned, by far, Northern California had a greater percentage of loyal Unionists than Southern California did. While pro-secessionists in the South responded to the start of the war by forming militia groups and plotting to overthrow the state, the state's pro-Union Democrats showed their support with a rally in San Francisco in May of 1861, which you can see pictured here. Northern support for the Union cause was also very apparent in the efforts of the Sanitary Commission in the state. While fundraising was difficult in Southern California, Northern California residents gave generously. It wasn't until January of 1865 that the Soldiers Aid Society um, that was part of the Sanitary Commission was actually organized in Los Angeles to attempt to encourage donations there. And the next month, chapters of the Aid Society were formed in Wilmington, San Pedro, El Monte, San, Ber San Bernardino, and San Diego. And volunteers began to go door to door to solicit gifts. Phineas Banning found the most success in Wilmington by the end of 18, February of 1865, which helped by news of key victories for the Union, Los Angeles County raised $1,170 in cash and $139 in coins. After all the excitement of the first couple of years of the war, pro-secessionists never had the same political or social influence again in the state. Many, like Los Angeles Sheriff Tomas Sanchez and Los Angeles Star Editor Henry Hamilton, stood by their Confederate-leaning positions, but were only really important to the people who agreed with them. Los Angeles County even voted to re-elect Abraham Lincoln in 1864, although the city of Los Angeles voted in favor of George McClellan. Lincoln's re-election was defeated in Los Angeles with a hundred gun salute and speeches by supporters. The celebration was described by the Los Angeles correspondent for the Alta California in the following way, quote, a conspicuous feature of the celebration was the illumination of W.W. Buffum's store and saloon. Mr. Buffum, a whole-souled union man, as generous as he is patriotic, had given notice that the proceeds of his sales during the day and evening would be donated to the sanitary fund. The United States Hotel was also illuminated, and from the roof of the courthouse, a fine display of, five, of fireworks were set off. The semi-weekly Southern News reported upon the telegraph of Robert E. Lee's surrender, quote, a simultaneous firing of guns sprang up in all parts of the city, which with a general merriment among Union soldiers was continued all night. The next day, the drum barracks in Wilmington celebrated by firing cannons all morning. A few days later, news of President Lincoln's assassination reached the city and military officials closed the telegraph for 48 hours for fear of violence. Initial celebratory reactions from Confederate sympathizers quickly ceased and military officials were given orders to arrest anyone showing joy at the news. Several men were arrested and soon released. Among those arrested was Peter Biggs, who was a former slave who considered himself a Southern gentleman or was a vocal Confederate sympathizer throughout the war. As an aside, Peter Biggs is a fascinating figure whose story is well worth reading about. So let me know if you're interested in a recent journal article about him because it's very interesting. Like much of the rest of the country, California was never the same after the Civil War. Residents who had been at odds during the war did not forgive each other easily, some taking their grudges to the grave. In Los Angeles, many Union veterans reported the loss of friendships and physical attacks resulting from their service. Confederate veterans also found it difficult to return to their former homes. Eventually, the animosity subsided and life continued. 
California and Los Angeles in particular, went through a tremendous period of growth and prosperity in the decades that followed the war and veterans were at the forefront of new towns, businesses and industries that allowed the state to thrive. With that, I'd like to thank you again for joining us today.